Safe when Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone. So who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the Hey everyone, I'm Seth Rudetsky, and I'm James Wesley. What? Um, you may have heard we are Seth must be flossing. What? I'm literally right. I'm actually the one that's here. What's happening? Um, so we're going to Greece tomorrow. Remember that crazy story? We we are using our frequent flyer miles to fly to Greece, and James is literally packing. So I'm flying solo tonight on Stars in the House. And you may say, what the H is Stars in the House? Stars in the House is a live stream we began when everything shut the hell down in March 2020. And we raised money for the Actress Fund. And again, you may say, what the H is the Actress Fund? That is not just for actors. It's for everybody in the arts, no matter what you do. Yes, the people that are on zero, the people that are sometimes on 14, as we say, people on the sides of the stage. Everyone backstage, everybody under the stage, everybody front of house, ushers, house managers, a publicist, everybody, TV and film all across the country. Everyone can go to stars. Uh, what is it? No, actressfund.org. That's what it's called. Actress, thank you, David. Actressfund.org, and you can ask for help. I would listen if you're an if you if you're an artist or if you know someone who's an artist, just check out actressfund.org because you have no idea how they can help. There's so many things that people don't realize the Actress Fund does. Just on this inside Broadway website, someone's like, "I need help with health insurance. What should I do?" I'm like. The Actors Fund, like they'll literally, who do we have on the show? We had someone on the show that said they called the Actors Fund who literally step-by-step step talked them through because she's not good with computers and they they actually helped her literally get her health insurance back on. So go to the Actors Fund and see what they can help you with. Um, if they can pay your rent, your grocery bills, or just lots of workshops. Now, if you can help everybody that, um, I'm not flying solo, very good tyke. I'm tomorrow, we'll be flying together. So you can donate at starsinthehouse.com because we raised a million around a week ago, and then we got another 30,000 in one night. So I decided I want to get to 2 million by the end of the summer. Keep it coming. You donated starsinthehouse.com. And then once you have donated, forward your, your receipt you're going to get to your email to donations at starsinthehouse.com. And I'll send it to one of these clowns uh, that's on the show tonight, and they'll do it. Beth Level will do it as a fiery 11 o'clock number. Lily Cooper will. Cooper will do it flying in the air. Ariel Jacobs will do it as someone who dropped out of school, Nina Rosario style. Leroy Reams will do it in a full split. Um, okay, so we are celebrating 54 below tonight. Feinstein's 54 below. I can't get used to that. It's like when Sirius merged with XM. I was always like, I'm on Sirius, Sirius XM. Like, I'm not used to it. Anyway, Feinstein's 54 below. We're celebrating tonight. Some of the shows that are coming in, the club is back and better than ever. And um, I'm going to start with my first guest. I have four great guests. I'm going to start with she. She has a Tony Award in her back pocket and a high belt. And actually, we're going to be in Provincetown together in September. Please welcome Mademoiselle Beth Level. Ah! It's not in my back pocket. It's right here with me. You know what? I love people that proudly display it. I can't send people like, I don't know where it is. I don't know. Like an but office you know or something. It's here because I dusted it. So it's like, well, why don't we just leave it and share it with Seth? Thank you. Thank you. Beth, what's with the looking maximum 35 years old? I just want to make out with you right now so much. Thank you. I get it. So, I get it. But oh, it's I, weird. I, no, it's uh, – bless you. No, I don't I, – I, I can't answer that question. I don't – thank you. I'm just going to say thank you. It's probably enhanced your appearance. I don't know. That's not – it's just you've looked the same ever since I met you literally – 35 years ago, basically. Again, we're just going to have to make out. Thank you. <sighs> I really, that's so kind. Thank you. I, you know what it is? I love what I do and I'm happy. And there you go. Maybe it reflects, but just don't look at me in the morning. <laughs> well, by the way, speaking of loving, speaking of being happy in your life and looking at yeah. you in the morning, when uh, do we know any marriage plans? Are we allowed to talk about that? Is anything specifically happening I need to talk about? Yeah, we actually were. You know what? There may be some information about this at my fifty-four below show. Shh, don't, I don't want him to hear. But we were actually planning a wedding, or starting to plan to plan a wedding, and then mm -hmm. the pandemic hit, and so kind of everything was on pause. And then we went through kind of a discussion about Adams going, "Let's just go to the justice of the peace." And I'm like, mm -hmm. "Nay, nay, nay, nay." If I'm going to do it, if it's going to be the last one. Mama is going to have a wedding. So 
we'll, we'll see. Now that things are opening up again, it's time for that discussion again. Don't forget, not only are we going to be in Providence, you're going to be yep. on my Broadway cruise in like maybe six months. Why don't you get married on the cruise underneath the Mexican sun and the this and the that? Well, that that would be awesome, except Adam's not going to be there. It's my best friend, Anne Van Cleef. Okay, well, you can get, you can have a non-traditional, uh, you guys are very close. We are. Okay. We are. We are. By the way, Anne was on the last cruise with us. I can't wait. She's coming um, again, yeah. Yeah, okay, just so this, you know, we planned a Whitney Houston song with the whole choreography and everything. I get so emotional, baby, every time. Yeah. Every time I think I don't, of I don't you. hit that. Time. She goes, time yeah. I think of you. And then we do this really awesome 80s choreography. I love that you've already planned the duet. Um, by the way, that is setsbroadbyvacations.com. Yes. come with us. Okay, so this 54 Below show, Beth Level, what are we going to expect from it? Well, I am so delighted that 54 Feinstein's 54 Below um, asked me back to, for an encore performance of a show I did two years ago about, and the title of that show was It's Not About Me, but of course it's all about me. Mm -hmm. And about Dee Dee Allen and some of my greatest hits. And um, because of the pandemic, you know, even songs you sang two years ago, to sing them again, they just resonate a little differently. They just have a little different lens with which to storytell. So I can't wait to revisit it again. And there's a couple of uh, new and fun things which may include audience participation. Okay, A, I approve. Thank you. B, you know, you're one of the few people that has kind of started working on musicals again, like we're not even really out of this. So can we talk about the new musical you're working on? Yes, I had um, last week, week before, somebody said it was July. It's like, when did that happen? Oh, me you too. It's like, I, I'm i constantly going, Adam, what is today? Friday, it's Friday, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're stars in the house. Anyway, um, I two weeks ago, we did a small workshop of the new musical coming in called The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, music by Sir Elton John, lyrics by Shana Tao, book by Kate Weatherhead, uh, directed by Anna Shapiro. I play a small part called Miranda Priestley. And I must tell you, it's going to be really amazing. Amazing. And I might be singing one of the new songs at 54 Below. Wow. I know. You haven't even heard it yet, Seth. We're going to sing it on the cruise. I just need to, you know, uh, for people to go, yes, of course you can sing it which I'm sure they will because everyone's very excited about it. But we'll sing it on the cruise too, but I'm singing it at 54 Below first. Okay, we'll do it on the cruise together. But let me ask you something. Have you even looked at what the costumes are gonna be like? Because they're gonna be amazing. I know, I went up the uh, costume designer. Please forgive me for not knowing her name. It was just all kind of a big blur, Ariane. And it was, she's a, a legend apparently. And I went up to her and I hugged her and I said, you know, I feel like you are my scene partner. And she said, yes, I am. So that's gonna be eventually, I'm, can you imagine what I am gonna be wearing? I, you know, Andrea Martin always said to me about Second City Television, SCTV, she said, I never fully found the character till I was in the wig and the costume. It I, really is like a scene partner. It's gonna be, uh, I mean, and do we even know hair, hair wise what it's gonna be? No, that's, and I keep, I'm just kind of, there's so, there's so many smart people in the room. And usually when I'm in a group of people, I always ask, cause I'm just curious if you think I have to don that silver wig, is it so iconic that it would be uh, confusing or can I go Beth Levels Miranda Priestley? I don't know the answer to that question and it'll mm. be really fun to figure out. I guess it depends on the clothes and whatever. It could I also know, be kind of exciting. It could also be 11 o'clock number style where you have Beth level hair and then right before the end of the show, you go into full silver, you know, the final look. See, there you go. I'm Is anybody listening? I'm um, I, I want to talk about raising a million dollars for the Actress Fund. We had a Amazing. live show for our staff and for our volunteers and the Actress Fund staff and Beth Level did the final <laughs> workshop of Devil Wears Prada, like literally full out. So it wasn't like it was like a full out workshop and five minutes later, you were at Asylum NYC performing. Weren't you exhausted, dear? Yes, but you know what? It's something Dr. LaPook said that night. He said actors and a lot of people in our community say yes first. Mm -hmm. You just say yes. And all that you and James have done, and Julie, all that you have done, I am how in the world gonna be like, oh my God, I just finished a little workshop when to celebrate the fact that you have raised a million dollars for us in our community. So I, I will always say yes. A, I love that. And B, yes, Beth has a Tony Award, but 
Miss Thing was struggling. We we talked about the time that she was starring in 42nd Street, starring Dorothy Brock, finally decided to take the family on vacation. And what happened when you landed at Disneyland? Literally, when I landed at Disneyland, the phone rang and my agent went. Uh, it was a message. And he said, um, can I call you back? I just want you to hear this before it gets out in the press. I'm like, what? So I called my agents back and it said, just so you'll know, 42nd Street was, you know, the revival was coming to the end of its run and they needed a star star to boost its ticket sales. So they said, yes, you're being replaced by Shirley Jones. So have a good vacation. But it totally makes sense. But I remember the rest of the vacation at Disney, you know, TJ or Sam would pick up something. It's like, you're not buying it. Put it, uh, uh, put it, nope, nope, put it down. So I was like, we're never going to eat, make money again. <laughs> but nope, that was pre Tony Ward. So it all worked out. It did um, work out. I want people to see this. So this is Beth Level. Now, by the way, um, Nina West from RuPaul's Drag Race was in the audience. Were you familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race? How did you know Nina West? I, I just, I just, I just have such a, a, a love for drag queens. She came. There was uh, one of the final, uh, I think, like twelve from RuPaul's uh, Drag Race that came to the prom, uh -huh. and we met and did a whole press thing afterwards, and that's how I met them. But I didn't really know her that well but she was so stunning and it, i just needed someone to i dragged her uh up on stage with me at this at seth and james celebrating a million dollars raising for the actress fund that was really fun it was great so this is this is beth after being depleted of all oh. energy this is this is her <laughs> low energy performance yeah well she, i'd like to be on some marquee all twinkle and lights a spark Washington Heights now or someday maybe all my dreams will be repaid heck I'd even play the maid to be in a show hey Mr. Producer I'm talking to you sir A Broadway baby slaving at the five and ten. I'm just dreaming of that great day when I'm gonna be back in a show. Cause I'm a Broadway baby, I'm making rounds all afternoon. Soon, eating at my greasy spoon. Soon, to say. Oh, and at my tiny little flat, there's just my cat. I'm going over here now. A bed and a chair. Still, I just am in love with you. I'll stick it till get up here. I'm on the bill. All over Times Square. Let's sing this on my day, maybe. All my dreams will be repaid. That's not the right word. Still, I'm gonna strut my stuff. Working for a nice man like a zinc fat or a wise man in a great big Broadway Belton show. Thank you, Seth and James. Beth Level. confession to make. Seth and I always work at just like, what are we doing? Don't tell me. Let's just do it. So I sit down and I thought the whole night I was going to sing Ladies Improving. So, and then he said, no, no, we're singing, we're singing a Broadway baby. So in the dark, trying to watch your show, I Googled, what are the lyrics? So I'm like learning, the relearning the lyrics as I'm sitting there watching your fabulous show. So, you know, very I love exciting. That. You were, you know, everyone was requested by a staff member and David Katz are, you know, who does everything for us. You were his request and that was his song. So I had to follow the request and Whatever you nailed it. David wants, <laughs> David gets a cat. You got it. Um, Fine Science 54 Below, when are you going to be there? What are the dates? Uh, the 22nd and 23rd. I think that's a Thursday and a Friday. Soon. 
Very soon. And then Provincetown, where they're Labor Day weekend. September 5th. And then Seth's Big Fat Broadway Cruise, January? January 5th through blah, blah. 2022. We're going to have a blast. Love you. Thank you for everything. Say hi to Adam. I will. Congratulations. Safe travels. Yes, ma'am. Bring <laughs> me a gift. Sure. Baklava. Bye-bye. Bye, lady. Yes. Mwah. No problems. That was fun. Now let me please bring on AJ, as she's known. By the way, I don't think she's known as that at all. Please welcome the amazing Ariel Jacobs. Hi, lady. Goodness. Hi. <laughs> what is with the stunning lighting? Where are you? In my house. I, no, I said you gotta go on for yourself because you're special. Stunning. Um, Ariel Jacobs, I first saw you starring in In the Heights, and now you're doing this 54 Below show, which is like dedicated to yeah. In the Heights, right? I know. It's like an In the Heights reunion concert for some of the cast from different productions. And um, it's going to be really fun. It's like it's like us singing some In the Heights songs and also singing just songs from other musicals that are based in New York City or about New York City. So it was very last minute, but it's going to be super fun. And I haven't been back performing there in such a long time. I'm just, I'm really excited. Um, you were Nina Rosario in In the Heights on Broadway. Was that your Broadway debut? Yeah, it was. Oh Opposite Lin-Manuel Miranda. How yeah. crazy is that? Like one of my favorite shows ever. I saw it 10 times. What an amazing role. What was the process in getting the role? Well, I was playing Nina on the national tour. So I was the original Nina for the first national tour. So How'd I did you get it that. Well, how did I get that? I was audition. I auditioned. I, I. That's the story. No, okay, okay. So I was in rehearsals for High School Musical two. Wow, you dodged yeah. the bullet. Gone. Well, I did High School Musical one. There's mm. the poster. I toured the country in that, and uh, and then we were came back for High School Musical two. And I told my agent I really wanted to go in for In the Heights because I had seen it. My mom just told me today that she found a Mother's Day card from, tw what, when did they win the Tony? 2008. Eight. Okay. So she found my Mother's Day card to her. <laughs> Good job. But she found my Mother's Day card to her for 2008. And I said in the Mother's Day card, um, happy Mother's Day. I love you. I bought us five tickets to go see In the Heights for Mother's Day, so we're going to see In the Heights. And we happened to see the show the night before the Tony nominations came out, so we oh, were just wow. so lucky that we even got tickets. And I remember watching the show thinking, I really want to play that part. I feel like I would be good in that part, and I love the show. So, yeah, I told my agents I wanted to go in for it. Um, what was really funny was at my final, final callback for the tour, well, actually, I thought it was for Broadway, but they were casting the tour at the same time, so it just worked out. I was wearing my High School Musical rehearsal clothes. I was wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt, and I forgot my outfit. So Did I walked- freak out? I, I freaked out because I, you know, this is like the final callbacks for Kevin McCollum and like all the whole team, the producers, every, there's like 12 people behind a table. And I go in there and I'm pretty green, I mean, I really only done High School Musical at the tour. So I kind of just laughed about it. I was like, I'm so sorry about my getup today. I'm in rehearsal clothes for this other show. And I just, I forgot to bring my change of clothes. And I think that, you know, in the end, it might have been a blessing because I didn't realize Nina's kind of a tomboy, right? Like Vanessa's got it going on. Right. And Nina's got jeans and like kids. <laughs> so in the end, I think it might have really helped. Oh, I love that. So then you got the national tour. And then when did you get the phone call? Oh, by the way, you're going to Broadway. Um, I don't know if you've heard the story on my solo album because I talk about the craziness of this whole experience. No, I didn't even know you had an album. Yeah, I did my solo show at 54 Below in 2017, right after I came back from playing um, Jasmine in Australia. So I did my solo show. I recorded it. Broadway Records put it out. And it's this autobiographical story about my life. And one of the things I say is I loved the national tour of in the heights so much and i wanted to do it on broadway so i decided i was gonna leave after my one-year contract was over because in my mind i'm thinking like a producer and i'm like okay so if i want to play it on broadway i need to be available hmm. and not booked on the tour because they're just going to leave me on the tour if i'm on the tour 
So I decided to leave the, the Broadway tour and hope that I'm gonna do it on Broadway. And two days after I left the tour, um, they announced that the Broadway show was closing, like oh in six weeks God. or eight weeks. And so I was devastated. So I, um, I called my mom, I was freaking out. I was like, I just made the basic, biggest mistake. I'm never gonna play this part on Broadway. And my mom says, uh, why don't you just call Broadway and you know, see if the girl wants to take a vacation? Cause you know the part, maybe they'll like want you to fill in for Christmas or something. So, wow, by the way, I love Call Broadway, 212 Broadway. I know, right that's on. what I said. I said, I don't think that there's a phone number for Broadway. So uh, I'm like, I, my mind, I was like, this is ridiculous. But, and then in the back of my head, I was like, but could it hurt? Like, maybe I should try it. So um, so I called my agent and I was like, um, okay, so I was talking to my mom and she had this crazy idea and maybe we should just call them and see what they say. So my agent at the time, I don't know if he thought I was crazy, but he did what I asked and he called the producers. And and then they said, you know what? This is so weird. We were just about to call you to see if Ariel wants to come play Nina for the final two months of the Broadway company. Oh my God. And it was just this really miraculous moment. And I, you know, I died and went to heaven because it was, it was one of those things where it's like, were they really gonna call me or did this happen because I put myself out there, you know? Right. I, oh my, it's what a great spiritual story. And P.S., you see how much Lynn loved you in the role, and so did I. Check this out. The one who always made the grade, but maybe I should have to stay home. When I was a child, I stayed wide awake, climbed to the highest place on every virus, escape restless to climb. I got every scholarship, saved every dollar, the first to go to bed. Everything's cool. The standard reply, lots of tests, lots of papers. Smile, wave goodbye, and pray to the sky. Oh God, what will my parents say? Can I go in there and say, I know that I'm letting you down, Nina? Oh my God, the placement. I'm coming back uh, home. Thanks. So good, girl. Hey, listen, you know, we're here with the actress one. I forgot we have some donations. Can you go to the private chat? Yes. And there are like four donations for you to read. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. I'm so um, glad that you're, that you're making this all happen. You're just incredible, Seth. Usually, well, usually James right next to me. So um, <laughs> thank you, Aaron. You're doing amazing. Um, okay, we have... David Katz. No, David Katz is the one who David sent Katz it. David Katz is the one who sent it. We have $54 in honor of an icon's return. Ryan in Wisconsin. Thank you, Ryan. I'm a, I'm gonna assume that's referring to me. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I came back. Um, and it says, thank you for all you do for the Actors Fund of the Arts and Broadway. Also, thanks so much for honoring our beloved Feinstein's 54 Below. My wife, Deb, and I were married, all married at Feinstein's 54 Below October 2018. And the amazing Calloways performed at our reception. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Toby from Texas. I love 54 bucks three times high for the Jews in the house. <laughs> yes. And then um, we have, this donation is in honor of Beth Lovell. Thank you, Beth, for being the reason I fell in love with musical theater and deviled eggs during the pandemic. And thank you, Seth, James, and everyone at Stars in the House for all you do. Liz from Nova Scotia, Canada, $20. Thank Canada. you. And then Greece is my favorite place on earth. Enjoy. Actually, Greece is like one of my favorite places on earth. Going so, tomorrow, girl. Yeah. Santorini, 
Yes, Queen. Well, we're going to uh, Mykonos. Oh, well, that's nice, too. That's nice, too. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, from Massachusetts. We love you. All right, before you go, I just want to ask you, why did you decide to, because if people Ariel, people don't know Ariel's brother is Adam, not since Rob Marshall and Kathleen Marshall has been such a talented family. <laughs> why did you decide to surprise your parents with um, Aladdin? Tell that story. That was so funny. So we were, uh, Adam had already been, you know, doing Aladdin for a while. And I got cast to play Jasmine in the Australian production to open the show in Australia. Um, so we were trying to figure out a really funny way to surprise my parents with the news. And um, we wanted to do it at this at this concert we were about to perform at it at Symphony Space, but uh, Disney said, no, you know, we're not allowed to announce it yet. So we were like, okay, well, let's do something secret and then we'll release it later. So we had this surprise. It was actually my husband's idea. Uh, my new husband, I'm married now. I wasn't married before last year. <laughs> um, so he, he had this idea, well, let's kind of trick them into thinking they're seeing another press thing for Adam, because they see press things all the time. Adam's doing so many press things. So we, we decided to fool them into thinking they were watching a press release of Adam performing with the new Jasmine in Australia, but we didn't tell them who it was. And then we hid hidden cameras around the room uh, and we played a video that we recorded of Adam and I in the studio singing A Whole New World together so we could tell them that it was for this press release. <laughs> that is so elaborate. I want people to watch this. It is such an elaborate ruse and it actually worked. Look at the shock the family goes into. Yeah. A whole new world. A new fantastic point of view. No one to tell us no or where to go. Or say we're only dreaming A whole new world A dazzling place I never knew But when I'm way up here It's crystal clear That now I'm in a whole new world with you Now I'm in a whole new world with you Unbelievable <laughs> oh, it's the best. That was the best moment. Oh my God. I love that. And P.S. We have someone watching right now in Australia. Ariel was amazing in our Sydney production. Oh, bye bye. Thank you. I loved it. I loved it. I love living in Australia for six months. What a dream come true. I effing love Australia. So, listen, before you go, In the Heights, 54 Below, when is the show? This Sunday, uh, July 11th at 9.45. Can't wait. And are One you night only. One night only. Any mm -hmm. Broadway plans? Any Broadway plans? I'm um, keeping my fingers crossed for Between the Lines, which was supposed to open at second stage when the pandemic started. So it's a new, brand new show based on a book by Jody Pico and um, Daryl Roth producing, Jeff Calhoun directing. And fingers crossed, you're going to get some news for that very soon. Yes, Queen. I love Jody. All right, peace out. Thanks for being here. Sunday night, 54 Below. Thanks, Seth. Bye, Air. Bye. So fun. What a great surprise. Isn't that incredible how she surprised them. Um, here's another 54 below lady before we go to our medical break. Please welcome to the screen the amazing Ms. Lily Koopa. Hi, Hello. Lils. What's up? I haven't seen you since our concert. I know. How are you? You were traveling. You like ran out to fly somewhere. I think you were flying to California. Yes. Oh my God. I got there literally like 15 minutes before my flight left. It was oh my it that was stress me out. That is so stressful. Ooh, that was so not fun. Um, I'll tell you what stressed me out. Your damn father letting a bear onto his damn terrace. Okay. Did you watch the videos? I just look at the screenshot. We have the, we live in the same neighborhood and I have the same terrace. Yeah. No, no, no. I know. It literally climbed up the wall to get to the bird feeders that were on his terrace. And him and his wife were in bed while this happened. So there was like, just a glass door in between them and a bear. Okay, I'm, I think I have the photo here. Everybody knows in my neighborhood, you don't put out bird feeders. So what is Chuck Cooper's problem? <laughs> I think he learned his lesson. I hope Hold he learned on. his lesson. I think I have this photo right here. Hold on, because my I think I do. Hold on for one second. Because my sister is obsessed with it. She's always sending it to me. Um, it's literally, a, now, but we have like the same bedroom and there's literally a terrace off the bedroom. So it's just right there. The bear was, 
It was just, they could just open the door and he was standing there. And then, so the bear got a little scared when it was trying to get down. So it started breaking the banister of the terrace. And as he was like breaking the banister, he started pulling the door open. So my dad had to close, like keep the door closed as the bear was pulling it open. It's, oh it's wild. It's okay, wild. do I have the stamp photo? I'm such in a state of freaking out. Um, okay, so that's fun. I'll find it. So let me ask you, Lily Cooper, your show's gonna be 54 below. What the hell are you singing? You sing amazing stuff on the show that we did together. I'm singing a lot of really fun stuff. I'm singing everything different from what we sang together. So all new things that Excellent. probably nobody's ever heard me sing. Um, the tagline is like show tune standards and singles. So it's really all of the above. But my concept is kind of like, I'm realizing that, well, as you know, I'm very pregnant for the audience. I'm soups pregs. Cam camera's right there, so there's no way to know. Yeah, you wouldn't know. But anyway, I'm pregnant. Believe me, it's true. Um, and one of the really fun things that um, as as you go through your pregnancy, like there are these fun apps that tell you all of the things that happen as your baby's developing, right? And my baby can hear. My baby can hear sounds from outside of the womb. And so I just thought that that was so magical. And the fact that I get to like sing and my baby can hear, and I want him to be able to hear the music that I love and that I grew up on and that I want to raise him on. So that's kind of my concept of the of the concert. So it's going to be a lot of a lot of great jams. You know, we had uh, Lisa Mordenti, Cheetah Rivera's daughter, on last week with Cheetah, and Cheetah was like seven months pregnant during West Side Story in London. And Lisa said to this day, she'll hear music and start tearing up. And she just like, oh, that's the part of the show that always got me really emotional. Like Lisa's positive she took in that music. Oh my God, I love that. See, that's so, what I mean. Like, I feel like it's so profound. I'm saying, that, hold on, I'm saying in the photos, we're gonna get it loaded. Hold on, there's one photo, because everyone needs to see this. It is profound. I wanna also say that you were, you became famous when you came on our show for uh, that amazing rip. Tell them how. Here we go. And I'm fine for my solo. At least I'm fine and free. So good. Tell them how. Second thing I want to say is during our concert, you and your dad, your dad won the Tony Award for the Life. And I was like, Lilius White had that amazing Tony Award winning song, and you guys sang it together. So, first of all, I asked you, I was like, oh, do you know it? So, you just knew it from kind of singing along with the record? Oh, I knew it literally word for word because I love the life. I've always wanted to, wanted it to come back. And I've listened to that album since it came out. So I knew it better than my dad did. My dad had to like refresh himself. And I, I, I love that. And I love Lilia so much. Um, yeah, that was really fun. I'm really glad that you threw that one at us because it was very hilarious to sing together. Here it is. I'll show you, before you go, I'll show you. It's the most inappropriate father-daughter duet. It's about basically working <laughs> as a sex worker and it's a fun song to sing with your dad. Enjoy. I'm tired of doing Dead beats, hikers, and haggling over the price. I'm tired of spending the weekends at Rikers. You never meet anyone nice. Well, I've done everything. I'm getting too old for the oldest profession. I'm getting too old for the life. I'm tired, 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 Yeah. 
Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. It was so fun. That's almost as inappropriate as seven-year-old me running around backstage at that show. Just so wrong. You know, it's Julie came to see me do the Ritz when she was six. It's all good. Yeah. Um, before you go, 54 Below show, what, when are you going to be there? July 28th and August 15th. I have, a, I have two shows. See the lady before she gives birth. And if people want to yeah. know, once again, my bedroom is the same as her dad. We're in the same neighborhood. My bed looks directly out to a terrace door, and this is what her dad saw. That is literally a bear in a bird feeder on the damn terrace. Look at the size of that F. What? And then he took the time to film it instead of going like, I'm literally moving. Right? Like he stayed there and filmed the whole thing. I would have been out of that house so fast. I'm, I can't. Talk I don't get it. Um, in conclude, what do you do, by the way? September 15th. My kid's birthday is September 22nd. Bravo. It's your Virgo? first kid, right? Yeah. Uh, Virgo, yeah. And um, any names picked out? Seth, Seth, Seth. <laughs> yes, yeah, Seth. No, yeah, we do have a name, but we're keeping it very secret. We're keeping it uh, close to our hearts. You're so private. Um, all right, Lily Koopa, thank you so much. Have a great time at your 54 Bye. Below show. You're mazing. Bye. Bye. Everybody go see that lady. Okay, before we bring in our final guest, I'm going to bring on my final doctor for the evening, uh, the CBS chief medical correspondent, Dr. John the Pook. <laughs> you're fine. Were there other doctors? Um, <laughs> no, my first and final doctor. I'm, I've got this perched on my on my lap because that's closer to the router, which is over there. The lighting wasn't so good there. I'm in Vermont, yada, yada, yada. Oh, you look great. Um, okay. What's going on? Are we getting a new booster? What's happening with Delta? Everything I feel is kind of getting worse. Okay. What's happening? So, so the, the booster thing, there's a little bit of a uh, Pfizer – is applying for you know to to get a booster approved right or authorized the cdc is saying it's not necessary right now so mm -hmm. they could both be right you know the it, you want to be prepared in case the current vaccines aren't working well enough but right now the current vaccines are working well enough even against delta um it's confusing because there have been reports about um you know there that they're less effective in terms of the amount of neutralizing antibodies they elicit, things that are, are blood tests that you take. Don't confuse that with the clinical effectiveness, which still seems to be very good, like over 90% for preventing serious disease, meaning hospitalization and death. And and here's, I think every time I come on, I want to say this, say this statistic unless it changes, which is the CDC has uh, done a survey of states over the last six months, not every state, but 99.5% of all deaths in the last six months have been in unvaccinated people, unvaccinated people. Yeah. I mean, it's so, what you said. It's like, I mean, the, the, the slight risk from a vaccine, which by the way, I wouldn't even say is a risk is nothing compared to the risk from no, COVID. It's infinitesimal compared to the risk of COVID. And the way that you prevent these, these, variants from getting worse is by getting vaccinated so they don't have the opportunity to multiply because every time they have the chance to divide they can have a they buy a ticket a lottery ticket to to do a mutation maybe it's a one in a million maybe it's a one in a billion chance of a serious mutation but there are trillions of viruses out there and the more there are the more you have a chance of the next variant being worse than the one before having a selective advantage and and you know that'll be the next variant du jour um, i don't want to forget to say that today was a big day because the CDC, I got it. Um, Dr. Rochelle Walensky is the head of the CDC. She is terrific. She has been terrific. At 6.42 a.m., I get a text from her today saying, mm. you know, let me know if you have a minute. She wanted to give me a heads up that at 11 a.m. today, there were new guidelines for schools. Really? Yes. Why? And the, so what I would advise everybody to do is this one, there's, there's a lot to read. I would read it, the devil's in the details, Google CDC. Uh, space, you know, school guidelines for COVID, you'll find it very quickly. But I will tell you that it's, as we've been talking about, a lot of multi-layered approach. So it's not a one size fits all. They are saying they want everybody to get vaccinated who can get vaccinated. That's obviously 12 and over. They would love to have all the teachers get vaccinated. They want kids over the age of two masked. They want people thinking about 
distancing. Um, they want people thinking about ventilation, all these things. But there's also a recognition that there are going to be differences based on what's happening, what's the temperature in the local place where you are. So you may be in a place, uh, and it's going to get complicated, where the local officials are saying, we don't want anybody wearing masks in school, and we're not requiring vaccination. And then I you want may national be, standards. Sorry, it's just making me crazy that it's local standards. Well, that this is the country we live in. So what? So the the complicated thing is, you may have parents who um, who are at home, maybe with an immunocompromised person in the household, and then you've got a kid who's going to school. Uh, they can wear a mask. So that's protection. But what if other people aren't wearing masks? What you know? And what if the teachers aren't vaccinated? So. That's a little bit complicated. I just want people to start thinking about that. And uh, that, you know, that remains to be seen how that works out. But here's something that everybody needs to think about. We are in the middle of respiratory syncytial virus season. It's, it came a little early. It's, you know, upper, so respiratory viruses, whether it's the common cold or whatever, the flu, that we're going to head into flu season. We're going to have a problem with kids in school who develop the sniffles or a cold, or upper respiratory infection. What is it? Is it COVID or is it right. some much you know, more benign infection? And so the answer to that is we're gonna have to have a lot more testing. And that's something I think everybody can push for. All you people out there who are listening, you gotta get involved locally. Um, Dr. Walensky told me $10 billion has been allocated for school testing, for testing in schools. So it's gonna, I said, because can a school call the CDC and say, send me a thousand kits? She said, no, you gotta go through the state. But I think this is something where people need to get involved on the local level. We have there's no reason why there shouldn't be more home testing. It shouldn't be 30 bucks a test. It should be two dollars a test or something like that. And we've got to just, you know, whatever, write your senators, call the FDA um, and, and certainly talk. You know, every meeting that you can be in at the local level, you need to be talking about the need for testing. It should be at least twice a week, I think, in order to really get a, a hold on the fact that, you know, we're not going to. Kids aren't going to be vaccinated and they could be in there with asymptomatic infections. And the final thing is anybody out there who's feeling sick, stay home. Don't be a hero. Don't go to work. And you, your boss is going to like you because, uh, you know, you, you're, you're toughing it out. You want to do something for everybody. Don't get everybody sick and don't send your kid to school with the sniffles. Testing is really important. And one of our favorite viewers, Ryan, just said, do you have any ideas when kids under 12 might be getting the vaccine? I mean, I'm hearing that it's going to be the fall. The, you know, the early fall, um, you never know for sure, but they're going in, I hear three year tranches. So it'll be nine to 12 next and then six to nine. They're doing all those tests right now. Uh, the other test, the other thing we've heard, everybody's saying, when is it going to be officially approved? You know, these mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna have approved for not just emergency use authorization, but official FDA approval. Cause some people are saying, well, when it's approved, then I'll take it. Um, so um, on background, I spoke to somebody at the FDA and they said, um, look, you know, there a lot of they're still looking at the data. There's a ton of data because all the people remember there were 74,000 people in the phase three trials between Moderna and Pfizer. Well, when they came finished that trial, the people who were on placebo all went over into the trial. They all got the vaccine. So now there's more data. Yeah. So they're looking at that more data. They're being very, very, very careful. You know, they're making sure that it's been out that when they finally say it's approved, it's because they've really looked at it long enough. Um, exactly. And, the, and then and they can say, you know, it's been, uh, even when they fast tracked the meningococcal vaccine, uh, it was at least four months. And these applications were just put in for formal approval in May. So, you know, I, I don't think it's gonna be tomorrow, uh, This uh, the formal approval. But the other thing is, I think a lot of the people who aren't taking it, it's not necessarily riding on the fact that it's not officially approved. I mean, 200 million people have gotten this vaccine. It's really safe. It's really effective. You want to do something for yourself, your community, the country, get vaccinated. For the world, these variants could get worse and literally destroy the world. It's like, it's just, do, don't do it for yourself. Do it for the world. All right. By the way, Kat Young, who was in Asia and worried about the vaccine, wrote she just got her second Pfizer. Yay. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Oh, yay. All right, Dr. Lapook, we're going to be in Greece tomorrow. Christine Petty is going to be here. So we'll be in touch whether she's going to need your amazing medical knowledge or not. I'm or here if she needs me. Have a wonderful trip. Safe trip. We'll be doing the show. Have All right. Great time. Bye, Dr. Pontate uh, Nazisate. You'll find uh, out what that means when you get to Greece. Uh oh. 
<laughs> you don't say it again. It's too scary. I can't memorize that crap fest. Um, okay. I'm going to end the show with one of my favorite Broadway stars. The talent level is so off the charts. I can't take it. And he's got a show coming up at Fine Science 54 Below. Please welcome the incredible Leroy Reams. Leroy! At last you're in my bedroom. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Lee, hold on. I'm actually, you just reminded me of something. So hold the phone for one second. You, by the way, you're impossible. Okay, hold on. Well, I have you on the, well, I have you right here. Okay. So a couple of things I want to say. Leroy is old school musical theater, but but he, uh, you know, he's from the, from the 70s when things were a little on the raunchy side. The first story I want you to tell me while I'm looking for something on my phone, please talk about when you met, was it Greta Garbo? Well, it was very brief. I was going to a meeting with Josh Logan on the east side, and she lived in his, his building over there on River House or wherever it was. I was walking over to see him, and this woman walked past me. She looked familiar, but I didn't even think about it. And she kind of smiled, and I smiled, and we nodded. And she walked by and went, my God, that was Greta Garbo. So anyway, that was my only brief encounter with her, but I did see her. And she actually seemed to be rather secure when she acknowledged me. And I thought, oh, how sweet that she did that. I, of course, had never met her, but I was just another human being on the street. But that's so you, because you also met Greta Garbo. You also met uh, the other, um, 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 Marlena Dietrich. Didn't you also meet her? No, I never met Marlena Dietrich, but who I had- Who who called you? Oh, who called me on the phone? Yes, and you didn't pick up. Oh, Mae West. Mae West. Okay, I knew it was okay. Please tell that story now. Oh, Mae West. I'm well, of course, I've always had this thing for Mae West. It goes back to being in Julia Prowse's nightclub act because Julia Prowse was from Johannesburg, South Africa. She exactly. wasn't familiar with Mae West. And my very first audition, my very first job in New York was the Julia Prowse nightclub act. And I got it. And Candor and Ebb wrote her act. And Billy Goldenberg was the conductor. I mean, if you can believe this, my first job. And uh, so anyway, uh, Julian had to do this segment that they wrote about how these old movie stars were doing horror movies. And so uh, Dorothy L'Amour did the hula and she strangled the man. And this time, of course, Mae West was that she to death. So yes. that was the whole gimmick. But yes. Julian Cross yes. didn't know Mae West. And so they brought in movies of Mae West to show her so she could get the... Mm, yeah, to get all that stuff going. So anyway, I was looking at the movies. I love Mae West. So I started, oh, yeah. So I could start doing Mae West too. Oh. So anyway, that's how it all began. So I got this thing from Mae West. And then finally, I was in Lorelei and Mae West, uh, we were doing, a, it was the LA company. And um, the producer who did all of those movies, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but anyway, she was one of his guests in the audience. So when we, we went out on stage, of course, I paid no attention to the what was going on. I was watching Mae West in the right. audience. So afterward, we went to a party and I went up to her to introduce myself. And of course, I when I get nervous, I talk very fast. So I said, oh, Miss West, I've been a family. I finished my speech and I turned to leave and she probably turned to her you know, guy and said, who the was that and he said oh. so then she called me I said, oh young man young man come here come here i came back and i leaned over i was standing she was sitting she looked right into my crotch and she said mm, you have a very lovely voice <laughs> but anyway and before that uh to go back earlier than that uh when i was in applause with lauren bacall and Betty was invited to- Betty Bacall, Lauren Bacall, Betty Bacall, yes. Yes, Betty Bacall was invited to a party for a Mae West movie, which I think was Myra Breckenridge. And of course, when I came into the theater, I always came to the theater early and I would sit with Betty uh, and then I would go upstairs and I always went home with her in the limousine. I mean, we were very close. It was a lovely time in my life. And so she said, you know, I got invited to this party for Mae West. And she said, you like to look at the waxworks. Why don't you go? So I called my then partner, now my husband, Bob, and I went uh, and, and, and called him. I said, please come over, Bob, bring my suit. We're going to meet Mae West. Oh, bring the pictures. I want her to autograph them. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, Bob said, no, I don't have time. Listen, you just come home. I'll have everything ready. We'll rush over. By the time we got to, I think it was one of the hotels over there on the east side. And when I arrived, she had already been there and she had left. And so I said to her representative, I said, oh, I'm so disappointed I brought my picture. She said, well, she's staying at the Pierre. 
And he said, well, she's very good. He said, about signing things, why don't you write her a note and leave the pictures there at the desk and she'll sign them for you. So I did. I wrote the letter and everything. So the next day, I mean, this is a true story. Bob and I were having sex and the phone rang. And so I went to get something. I said, if you do that, I'll kill you. So I did. So I finished what I was doing. Then I called my, in those days, we had answering services. So I called my answering service and the answering service said, you just got a call from Mae West. I could have killed Bob. Oh my God. I mean, first of all, I love, I finished what I was doing. It's so pedantic, your version of sex. That is well, I mean, that was a darling. I mean, you know, we were together for 50 years. So, you know. That- yes, you're darling, Bob. Lucky okay, so- what a lot of people don't know, I just want to talk about Leroy. So Leroy is going to be 54 below. The voice, if people don't know the crazy voice, let me just play you a sampling of his voice. He reminds me of Anna Pascal, where someone that originates a role and then everyone wants to kill that person from then on because the keys are crazy. This is Leroy Reams in 42nd Street, and this is the crazy, crazy voice he had eight times a week. Oh, I mean, it's crazy, your voice. You, you should have seen what I did to get that out. <laughs> Those are tight pants. Right. Okay, so before I play more 42nd Street clips, please talk about how you got that job. Because I tell your story all the time because it is so inspiring. You took you took management to your own hands. Yeah, I just I just want to finish the story about May. And so anyway. Oh, there's more? I thought the sex no, was no, the end no. of it. Then I called the Pierre and uh, and I got her representative and he said she literally just walked out because she's going over to the graveside of her family. And then she's going to the airport. But he said, if you ever get in uh, LA, here's her number, call her and she will see you, which I never did. What a fool I was not to do that. But she signed all the pictures that I left and everything. I mean, it couldn't have been more wonderful. She was a, 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 a wonderful person, obviously. So anyway, so now we get to, what do you want to know about? Uh, By the way, I'll tell you, Leroy, I'll tell you my one Mae West story that Kevin yeah. Chamberlain told me when he did Dirty Blonde. Yeah. He said that Mae West was walking through a casino and some guy yelled over from the craps table, hey, Mae, I'll lay you 10 to 1. And she said, it's an odd time, but I'll be there. <laughs> It's such a great line. Uh, okay. Okay. No, just one more quick story about my yes, ma'am. A friend of mine, uh, Johnny Frere, who's a, a wonderful dancer in California, and he did her last movie, Sex Ted. And he called me one day and he said, Leroy, sit down. I've got this story for you. He said, now sit down. I said, I'm sitting down. He said, they're filming me. And he said, she's having a hard time hearing. She doesn't know her lines. So they talked to her through a hip piece in her ear telling her what to do. He said, the director was saying, okay, May, get ready. We're going to do the close-up now. Go on, May, get sexy. And she went, oh, no. He said, that's right. Now, May, walk over to the dressing table. Oh, Okay. Stop, cut. They got her down in the chair, got her all set. They got her at the dressing table. He said, okay, May, get sexy. I said, oh, mm. he said, okay, May, now pick up the mirror, pick up the hairbrush, and brush your hair. So, mm, mm, mm. He said, cut. May, you're brushing your hair with a mirror. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, I can't make these things up, Seth. I'm telling no, you. No, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> she's not she's not a prop comedian. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're talking about 42nd Street. So yeah. it's a classic story. It's what a problem being in the business for a long time because people know your actual age. So yeah. you're super young looking and you were what a ripe 38 years old at the time. Yeah. That's right. And you wanted to play the juvenile in 42nd yeah. Street, which you were perfect for. So yeah. what happened? Well, I mean, to make the story longer, when I was doing Hello Dolly, uh, the revival with uh, Mike Stewart, we became very close. And he told me he was writing a musical in 42nd. I said, oh, I know the film very well. I want to play Dick Powell. Never heard for a couple of years. And finally, I get the call from the agent. I have an audition for 42nd Street. So I think it's the Dick Powell part. So they give me the time. And I said, by the way, now, what's the name of the character? And they said, Andy Lee. And I said, is that the Dick Powell character? They said, no, the Dick Powell character is Billy Lawler, but they think you're too old for that. So there's another character in the show. He's about 40. Uh, he's a choreographer, a little on the tough side. I said, why am I doing that? So I told, you know, Bob, I said, I'm not going to go. I don't want to do that part. But it's a waste of time. And Bob said, don't be silly. Why don't you just go in, do what you do? A light bulb went off on my head. So 
But in those days, of course, darling, we auditioned in theaters, which is a whole different experience. I'm mm. telling you, what a shame we can't do that anymore. Because what you do in a small rehearsal room and what you do on a Broadway stage is day and night. Anyway, yes. that's my story. I go to the theater and uh, my, my accompanist, I said, now look, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to start out with the uptune. Don't wait to hear them say, do you have a ballad? Go right into the ballad. And Tony Kay, who was one of the best dancers ever in the world, was in town. We had just done the show together, and we did a big tap dance that I had choreographed. And I said, Tony's in town. I'm taking her. I'm going to have my tap shoes on. She's going to come out. We're going to do this number. This can't be love the Rogers and Hart tune. And I'm going to do a tap dance. And I'm going to keep going until they throw me out of the theater. So they announced me. I went out. I sang the uptune, went right into the ballad. And I did look into the balcony and picture that dear sweet face of Ruby Keeler. And I sang, I only have eyes to you, to her. And then Tony came out. We did this big tap dance. And when I finished, there was literally dead silence. A 20 minute sort of force. They're going to kill me. And coming down the aisle, I saw Gower Champion, and he came to the front of the pit, and he went like this. And I walked forward, and I leaned, and I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, you're not right for the role of Andy Lee. I said, yes, I know that. He said, you're very right for Billy Lawler. And I said, yes, I am. And that's when I got it. I swear to God, Seth. Yeah. That's how I got the part. It's a great story, first of all, about the annoying gatekeepers of Broadway who prevent people from auditioning sometimes, which drives me crazy. But then about sort of not being negative and trying to go past. Uh, in Tina Fey's book, she calls it over, under, through. And you've got a barrier in front of you over, under, through. And that's what you did. And you, you got it, man. And you were so brilliant in that part. Well, it was, you know, and, and it, it, it's funny because I had so many conversations with Gower and uh, I told him, uh, you know, I said, I always wanted to be at MGM. I just was born too late. I wanted to be at MGM. I wanted to be Fred Astaire. I wanted to be Gene Kelly. I wanted to be you. I wanted to be all those guys. And he said, I understand that. He said, because I came at the end of that. And he said, I'll make that a present to you in the show, which was very sweet. And uh, he said, you know, uh, I wanted, he said, we're old fashioned song and dance men. And he said, you know, during the seventies, he said, I tried to be with it. He said, mm -hmm. I did the drugs. I went to the discos. I did all the stuff you're supposed to do. And he said, I just woke up one day and had to face the fact I'm an old fashioned song and dance man. And he said, and when David Merrick offered me 42nd street, he said, although I was ill and my doctors didn't want me to do it, and he said, I've had a checkered past with David, and I knew how difficult it was going to be. But he said, Leroy, I had to do it because I don't want to be remembered as a has-been. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah. Well, and I thought of that. I thought of that the night on stage when uh, the curtain you know, came down after they said, Gower Champion is dead. I mean, David Merrick said. And so that was... That was the first thing that came into my mind. I don't want to be remembered as a has been. And of course, 42nd Street was his greatest uh, success of his Broadway career. And the last time I saw him, we knew he was in the hospital. And uh, we did a, 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 a performance with a few people in the audience, maybe about not even a third of the house. And we all were allowed to invite one person. It was like the only preview that we had that, that David Merrick would allow. And uh, when I was coming down that night and I passed Wanda's dressing room, Gower was in her dressing room and we hadn't seen him, you know. So I went in, of course, and we're all carrying on. And uh, I said, well, you know, Gower, you've got a hit show. You heard the audience tonight. This was our first audience. They went crazy. You've got a hit. And Wanda grabbed Gower and she said, it's all because of you. And Gower pulled me in with Wanda and squeezed us so tightly. And he said, no, it's because of us. And I tell you, Seth, I was moved to tears. I had nothing more to say. And I left the dressing room. That's the last time I saw him. If, if people don't know, he was sick. He bizarrely died on opening night. And then David Merrick with all of his machinations kept that a secret from the cast, invited all these reporters to the show and said there's going to be a big announcement after opening night. And then as the whole cast was on stage, he said Garrett Champion has died just so that the reporters could see the whole cast basically have a breakdown. So you had no idea that the announcement was going to happen? Well, that day, we got a call. We're at home. This is opening day. 
and we've got limousines and, you know, people coming in and all this and that. And uh, we got a call from the office. David wanted us to come to the theater for a rehearsal. Now, we were supposed to have opened the first week of August. We didn't open until August 25th, which ironically enough was Ruby Keeler's birthday. Huh. And uh, and David, you know, would sit in the audience and do the show with no one there. He just had this thing going on for weeks. And, you know, and the kids one night put their pictures and teddy bears on the seat so we could have an audience. So finally, it's opening night. We get a call to come to the theater to rehearse. But you did what David told you to do. So we all go to the theater. We get in there. They literally locked us in the theater. And uh, we didn't rehearse. So we do the opening night, and there we all are. And then David came out on stage at the end, and I thought he was going to say, uh, Gower Champion could not be here tonight, and I would just like to take this opportunity to thank him for this. That's what I thought he was going to say. And we were all, you know, David came out, and David said, this is tragic. Well, everybody laughed because we had like 15 curtain calls. And he said, Gower Champion died this afternoon. That was it. And we all just went, <gasps> and the audience gasped. And Jerry Orbach, thank God had enough sense to look at the stage manager and said, bring in the curtain, bring in the curtain. And the curtain came down and that was it. No. He wanted you, you know, it's before cell phones, so no one could text you and he wanted you trapped in the theater so you That's couldn't right. get information. That's right. That's right. And he had, he had security guards at the theater for the month. You could, he wouldn't let anyone into rehearsal. And one night uh, they had allowed some of the, uh, they we, we were all given a ticket and some of the people came to the theater and David found out that uh, Cliff Jar from the New York Times was there. And David went and canceled the performance. He said, there's been a rat in the generator. We can't do the show tonight. So they left and then we did the rehearsal with David in the audience. Oh, I mean to tell you, it was such a carnival. You can't believe. But there's a whole book about David Merrick called The Abominable Showman and who boy. But to so, know what? He was brilliant. He so, was brilliant, but brilliant. not a nice guy. But what's interesting, made, you know, you talk about, what are you going to say? No, and he made the show a hit by using that because we were on the front page of every newspaper and yeah. our reviews were suddenly news stories. So we got all this incredible stuff and the show ran for eight years. I mean, he made the show a hit because people come to New York, they just go, oh, I heard of that show. And they just heard of it because it was on the front page. I mean, he, he was brilliant, but who boy. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting you talk about being a song and dance man because, but you also were really able to become a hip dancer. You were a, you were a Fosse dancer. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, I started, did you... out, I started out my career as a dancer. And well, you know, I, went through, just... you know, I went through all of those schools in Covington, Kentucky and Cincinnati, Ohio, where they taught tap toe ballet, acrobatic baton ballroom, voice personality and culture. <laughs> and then I was a ballet major at the uh, College Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati. And so, but I was also, I studied voice at the uh, conservatory, the college conservatory also. So, you know, I studied very hard. So when I came to New York and, you know, thank God for those four years of college, they were just great to me. And I, I had my uh, equity card because I got it uh, doing summer stock. And I came to New York basically as a working professional. So, you know, I, I was ready to go. So I never had any problem, Seth, but I worked very hard. I was prepared. You also, by the way, had crazy massive talent. But you know, now yeah. everyone talks about the Fosse style, but you were actually learning from Fosse. So, like, what actually is the Fosse style from the person that actually learned from Fosse, not learned the style of Fosse? Like, what well, was it? You just have to look at his body and put yourself into that question mark position and you <laughs> do the work, you know. But, and I mean, I, I could talk to you, darling, until the cows come home. But uh, basically, uh, I, when I auditioned for Sweet Charity, Fosse didn't particularly care for me because I wore ballet tights to the audition because I came from ballet school and you couldn't buy dance pants. You know, they didn't have them in Covington, Kentucky and Cincinnati. So I wore my ballet tights. And so he didn't particularly care for ballet people. So he wasn't paying attention to me, but Gwen was watching me and I knew she was looking at me. And then when we sang, of course, I was a studied singer. And in those days, dancers didn't necessarily sing and singers right. didn't necessarily dance. That was like the beginning of melding those people together. So uh, once I opened up to sing, uh, Cy Coleman jumped up and ran over to Fosse and I knew that was it because uh, he liked my voice. And actually the first day of rehearsal, Cy Coleman was wonderful to me and uh, told me how much he, he loved my singing. And, uh, you know, and I was supposed to have done Seesaw. That's a whole other uh, interview that we can do. Yeah, that part was supposed, supposedly my part. There's a whole story about that. 
Oh my god. Well, hold on. I'm gonna go back for a second for Gwen because you got to do that number where you're in sort of the sombreros and the little mustache, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was so honored that Bobby had asked me and Buddy Vest to do that number with Gwen. It was we were in rehearsal just uh, the four of us in a room with a, a pianist for a week, and I'm telling you, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. He set that number on us, and it was just artistically a highlight of my life. And then when he asked me to do uh, the film of charity, I was so flattered because uh, when, I mean, to go back to the story about he didn't particularly care for me. And uh, in rehearsal, when we were doing the fruit, we were all supposed to carry cigarettes. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't smoke. And I really don't want to smoke. And I thought, well, if I lose the job, I'm not going to smoke. So I said, well, I guess you can just carry an unlit cigarette. So I did. And uh, then, of course, for the movie, I had to smoke. I took one puff, and uh, we did it in one take, so thank God. But anyway, uh, then when we got out of town, he wasn't really that fond of me. And then we did our first preview, and he came back. Say, so this is a true story. I'm not bragging. He came back into the dressing room, and he said, what were you doing out there tonight? And I thought, this is it. He doesn't like me. I'm going to be fired. And I said, I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean. He said, perform like that. He said, I never saw you in rehearsal doing that. I couldn't keep my eyes off of you tonight. You were out there. And I said, well, you never asked me to perform. I do know. So anyway, and that was it. Then I became a favorite. So and wow. I, I, I listen. And uh, to make a, a longer story longer, after we went to, after the, the thing, uh, the opening night of 42nd Street, we went to the uh, Waldorf Astoria for opening night party, which, by the way, was just fabulous because we only had one producer. So we were seated, seated at tables. Uh, we were served at tables. It was just fabulous. And when I went in, the first person I ran into was Bob Fosse, who came oh. to me and he said, that son of a bitch. He said, I filmed my own death and all that jazz, and he had to do me one better by doing it on opening night. And we laughed, and I said, oh, Bobby, I said, if Gower's looking down tonight, he's having a big laugh with us. So, I mean, you know, I'm blessed, Seth, I'm blessed to have had all these people in my life, truly. Yes. Let me ask something. I'm going to show a little clip of you and Cheetah doing the number. I mean, not you and Cheetah. You remind me of Cheetah. That's why I said that because Cheetah always says she's blessed. You and Gwen. So if Gwen's facing out, which side are you on? It's so hard to recognize which one uh, is who. I, 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 I don't know. I'll have to look. I think I'm on, on the audience right. That's what I think you are too. Audience right. Here, let's take a look. <laughs> with Gwen man okay um two more things I'm gonna show you, you did you ever see um hello dolly you did hello dolly with Cornelius mm -hmm. and you know Charles Nelson Raleigh would always go listen Barnaby and open up the vowel it drove me crazy you did a pure vowel I assume yeah thank yeah. you absolutely and as a matter of fact I'm bragging again but it's a true story I Jerry know. The first time I did that out there and I did and Jerry jumped. And I said, that's the voice. That's the voice I heard in my head when I wrote that. That's the voice I hear. Well, obviously we became good friends after that. And Leroy Reams, you and Jerry Herman were so close. And actually, literally, this is 1977. You as Cornelius I actually found this clip. Have you seen this? Watch this. Out there, there's a world outside of younger. Way out there beyond this hex house, Barnaby. There's a slick house, Barnaby. Out there, full of shine and full of sparkle. Close your eyes and see it glisten, Barnaby.
I love the blue note. Listen, Barnaby, it's so good. Well, that started the whole thing because Jerry said to me, he said, you know, I, I'm a woman's composer. I said, that's not true, Jerry. I sing your songs all the time. I said, it's not true. And then he started asking me to do little gigs with him. Like he would play piano and I would sing. So we would go different places together. And that's what all morphed into doing that evening we did at uh, Rainbow and Stars at the Rockefeller Center with Karen Morrow. Awesome. And, yeah. Who, uh, I mean, that's a voice, darling, that... Anyone who was blessed to have ever heard it, she was just incredible. But it would have been Flo Lacey because he loved Flo's voice because he chose Flo for that Dolly revival. And, of course, I didn't know Flo. And I, I just heard this. Uh, the, the girl playing uh, uh, Irene Malloy is one of Jerry Herman's best friends. Now, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't Florence Lacey. She walked in, this gorgeous Irish girl with big blue eyes and this thrilling voice. I was in love with her. And I told her a couple of days later, I said, you know, Flo, I have to tell you something fun. You can't imagine what I thought you would be knowing you were Jerry Herman's best friend. She said, stop. Imagine what I thought when I heard that you were Carol Channing's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Two bitches. Uh, I got that part because of Carol Channing, because of doing Lorelei. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I listen. I do this in the act, but you know, I'm giving a little bit. But this is this is a true story. So, hello, Leroy. It's Carol. Carol Channing is dear. Listen, I'm going to do a revival of Hello, Dolly, and uh, I want you to play Cornelius Hackle. But dear Jerry Herman doesn't know you, but don't worry, honey. You've got the part. First of all, that's an amazing imitation. Second of all, the Jerry. I was noticing an elegance. Never really carry it off. Normally it goes down. You went up to the high third. It off. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're a bitch. Listen to this. And we got elegance. We got built in elegance and with <laughs> oh. Honey, you'd have to put on a rubber glove and stick it up. You know where to get me to hit that now. Cut. <laughs> I found this super sexy picture of you in applause. Look uh, how yes, is. yes. Look at those gams. Are those? Is that from ballet or is that just genetic? Uh, no, it's it's from all of the ballet training. And I've been dancing since I was a kid, Seth. I I was born dancing. It just was a natural thing that happened. That's the reason my mother put me in school. Cause I just got up in front of everybody and would sing and dance at every opportunity. It wasn't anything that was forced upon me. And my, I, I was just lucky to have the, the best mother for me in my life. And she, uh, she, you know, she took me to school and trained me and uh, I've never known anything else in my life. And I, I took courses in high school to be, uh, to take shorthand and typing in case I had to get a job that I could actually do something. And then in college, of course, I was a theater arts major. And, uh, but I wanted to have a skill in case I couldn't get a job because I knew I was going to go into show business. It was, I trained and everything in my life was done that way. And I had an incredible, uh, professor at the college conservatory of music. And, uh, he became my mentor and gave me so much. I, had those four years of training and then i also had this incredible gay man who was a, a mentor to me not sexually but that i could look up to who was a classy guy and was quite smart i learned so much and he took me under his wing and my junior and senior year at school i was directing choreographing and playing the leads on all the musicals mm -hmm. and he gave me that and that's how i got trained and I was just lucky being at the right time at the right place with the right people. I know you hear all these stories where I know we were on a panel once and everybody was saying, you know, if you go into show business, it's a hard life and you got to work hard and you got to know there's going to be times when you got to wait tables and you got, and all of this and that and it came to me. And I said, I'm sorry. I just can't say that. That's not the way it happened for me. I, I worked very hard to get what I did. And I went to my first audition, first job and I got up and I was able to show people what I could do. And I, I got the part. And uh, th and also the same thing happened with, I mean, I tell these stories all the time, Seth, but you know, here we are. Uh, Richard Rogers, the audition for uh, Will Parker. I love uh, that. Center. That was my first role in New York. And uh, uh, I was auditioned privately for Richard Rogers. 
And I thought, well, I'm going to impress him with the fact that I'm really a singer rather than just being a dancer. So I decided to sing Leonard Bernstein's Lonely Town. Oh, to town, cross, lonely yes, town. To nice. my voice because I was told, do not sing a Richard Rodgers song. He doesn't, he doesn't like people when they goof on the lyrics or don't sing it perfectly. Do not sing a Richard Rodgers song. So I got out about two lines of, you know, Lonely Town. He said, I already hear you sing that song. You're here to audition for a comedy character. Don't you have a comedy song? And I said, no, 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 I didn't bring one. But I said, I know Kansas City. I could sing. He said, well, why wouldn't you sing that? You sing it in the show. And I said, well, I'd love to sing it for you, Mr. Rogers. And I sang uh, Kansas City. And he said, now, now, can you dance? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, then show me. And I had a dance routine. And so I did my dance routine. And when I finished, I swear to God, Seth, this is, this, this is a true story. He said, young man. And I said, yes, sir. He said, is there anything you can't do? I said, no, sir, there isn't. And I got the job. Girl, it's true. I never I read like, the script. They never asked me to read the script. I am like so blown away by, by, by your um, triple threatness. Um, okay, so first of all, your 54 Below show is coming up. I have to have you back. I want to have you back with Karen Morrow. But before you go, I'm just going to show you in 40 Second Street. What I love is that there's such crazy aerobic energy. Like, was it choreographed that way? Or did you bring that when you do money? It's so crazy energetic like was well, that Gower or was that you yeah um, well i'll tell you the true story Gower did not tap dance <laughs> he didn't <laughs> and he hilarious. had his two assistants karen baker and randy skinner yeah did a lot and he but he he designed it uh -huh. you know, and they kind of put the steps in and uh so one day i was not supposed to do we're in the money originally it was supposed to be the girls and the gypsy tea kettle they oh. that was going to be the number they did uh we're in the money and, uh, you know, because, you, know, you know, but anyway, uh, so one day Gower came up and rehearsed and he said, you're working so hard in the show and you're so good. He said, I want to give you a solo. I'm going to give you money. And I said, great. And he got Randy and Karen. He said, let's go in the other room. So we went in the other room and he designed it physically where he goes, he said, now come out, now come down, now go stage left, do yeah. steps, then come back. And he said, now you're going to get up on the dime, but we got to lift it up. I said, well, I'll just stand in the front and do this. And I put the tap steps. And he said, now get up on the dime, now do your steps. And he said, now do a thing around it, on the outer rim, do something around there, now do that. And I did my own taps, but we designed the number together. I see. And it was it was incredible. I mean, it, I, and also when uh, – I was told, you know, that, that he liked me. But then I was called back in uh, to rehearsal, I mean, to audition. And uh, my agent said, well, you know, he's very famous for uh, changing his mind, you know, like oh. back in maybe stories, how he had three different Mabels and all that. So when I came back, they wanted to see me again for my second audition. I thought, well, this is it now. Everybody in town is going to be there. No, it was just me. And he had me come and said, I want you to do what you did before, but I didn't have Tony with me, but I did the dance. And he said, because I'm getting ready to pick Peggy Sawyer and I want to see how you match up. But I still hadn't signed a contract. Then the third time I was called into rehearsal, my agent said, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this, Leroy, because you don't have a legal thing. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm going to do it. It's our champion. So we went in and it was Lisa Brown. Uh -huh. It was the girl. So we came in and we worked with her, Randy and Karen, myself and Gower. So we worked with her. And uh, then she left and Gower asked me, he said, so what do you think? I said, well, I adore her. I think she's so right for the part, you know. And uh, Karen said, well, you know, she's not the world's greatest tap dancer. Well, she got the part. I was going to say she did get the part. So but then, Yeah, but then that weekend at the open call for more dancers, Wanda Richard was wow. there and Gower wow. said she's terrific and Karen said well that's the girl who sent you the videotape she was doing chorus line and you never looked at it and they said well let's keep her after maybe she can be the understudy so after the the audition he danced her and he changed his mind Lisa wow. Brown had left Best Little Whorehouse in Texas she had left her soap opera to do the show because she went now on the, so on Monday morning when she was going to go down to sign the contract, they called and said he changed his mind. The end of the story is she took over the role. After Wanda left, yes. But Gower was, of course, dead by then. Oh. And she replaced Wanda. Oh, my God. I did not know that she was originally cast. Holy mm -hmm. shite. 
Okay, so I'm going to show this to close. So wait a minute, you're the one that came up with those crazy points? It's so weird. What was that base on? It's such a weird, what are you pointing at? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, I wonder what's watch is this. It's such a star making performance. The energy level, I'm just obsessed with the way you dance this. Here, watch everybody, you're gonna flip out. <laughs> It ends in a bevel, which I'm obsessed with. I mean, when you look at that, are you like, I must have been in the most amazing aerobic shape of my life? Well, I was 38 years old, and that was done at West Point. And I, I have a, a funny story to tell you that when we were at West Point, of course, all the cadets, you know, and they put us in, uh, we were there at the field, and they put us in like the sports locker room. That's uh -huh. where we were dressing. And so uh, there was a kid that was going to ride a horse dressed as a knight in the armor with a lance. And he rode a horse at the beginning of the thing. And it was Bob Hope, of course. And so they put the kid in the dressing room with us. So I told the boys, I said, now listen, you all, everybody behave because these kids are very structured and it's very, you know, military and all that. So you behave yourselves while this kid's going to be in the dressing room. So he came into the dressing room and of course the boys were all there. And I said, well, hello, I'm so happy to meet you, and you know you're gonna. Family's gonna be very uh, excited and uh, honored to see you working with Bob Hope. But that I said, well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And this that, and John Engstrom, who was always so particular, came out of the room with his dance belt on, went over to this kid at a releve, put his leg around and put his arms around him, and said, "Oh, what a night!" Well. <laughs> That kid left that dressing room. We never saw him for the rest of the day. It was hysterical. <laughs> a releve and a front attitude. Uh, uh, um, yes, wrapped around the kid. And the kid's all done up, you know, in the armor. Oh, it was the, it was the 80s. It was the <laughs> 80s. Um, all right, in conclusion, everybody, Leroy's got amazing stories, and you know that voice is just stunning. So when are you going to be at Fine Science 54 Below? What are the dates? Well, I'm going to be there July the 13th, which is this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and it's sold out, but, you know, you never know what happens. Call for tickets anyway. But anyway, they've asked me to actually come back August the 23rd to do yet the third show, which I'm more than happy to do. And actually that is my birth date, August 23rd. Are you a Leo? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the end of Leo, the beginning of Virgo. So depending on who you talk to now, that's also the birth date of Gene Kelly. And that of course is my idol and we're both Irish. And when I met him, the only time I met him, I told him that and he sent me an autographed picture with the fact, you know, it's our birthday and I was very honored and flattered and I treasure that, by the way. Uh, he was so talented and so dreamy. Oh. Um, all right, Leroy, great hanging out with you as usual. Um, really lovely. Everyone go see him. If not, this one, which is sold out, get your damn tickets for August. No, no, and it's, it's Jerry Herman. I mean, come on, you know. The best music. My favorite.
Oh, God, he was so talented. All right, Leroy, great seeing you. Uh, happy Thanks. early birthday. See you soon, I hope. And everybody, thanks for watching Starts in the House tonight. Peace out, bye. Oh, I got to announce this. Bye, Leroy. Tomorrow, Christine Petty is back with the ladies of Forbidden Broadway. So it's all those amazing women that do Forbidden Broadway with Christine Petty. Some of those, I mean, hilarious and brilliant people. I was just thinking about um, Lori Hamill. so funny. Anyway, so that's tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We'll be on our plane to Greece at that time. That's why we can't host. Um, thank you, David Katz. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to roll credits. One, two, three credits. I should play something, shouldn't I? Um, what do I got? All I remember from that damn show. And I actually played it on Broadway. I don't remember people. Um, thank